All right. This is your Gods of War sit rep day 187. And um could say no end in sight. There are interesting things happening. The us you've probably heard that the Politburo, one of the leaders of Hamas, Ismail Haniye, his family, three members of his family, some of his sons, uh, more than five members of his family, three of his sons and some of his grandchildren were assassinated in an airstrike, a targeted airstrike by Israel. One of the, um, some Israeli news person said, referred to Amalek and said something like, remember what Amalek did to or wipe out the seed of Amalek or something. So they're still doing their Amalek thing, their genocidal incitement on public uh, media, uh, celebrating the assassination of this political leader's family. So people said that this may have had something to do with trying to scuttle negotiations or sabotage negotiations. Israel likes to do assassinations during negotiations, but Israel likes to do assassinations during peacetime and wartime and any other time. So it's not exactly that you can relate the timing of an assassination to the negotiations. As for the negotiations, Hamas will continue to insist on rebuilding, return, Um, full ceasefire and uh, and then the prisoner exchange timing being negotiable but those are not going to change and so until Israel is ready to accept those the war will go on so it it's one dynamic that I think people need to understand at this point which is the terms of the ceasefire are going to be static they're not going to change it's not going we're not going to get a we're not going to get a peace deal because hamas changes its uh negotiating stance the nego the four pillars of hamas's stance are never going to change Re they're always going to be that a full withdrawal a full ceasefire rebuilding access to un unfettered access to humanitarian aid and people getting to return to where they were bombed out from. That's it. Those are not going to change. Israel is not ready to accept that now. And therefore, the war will go on. And when Israel is ready to accept that, then the war will stop. And that is, we are going to be doing sit reps until Israel is ready to accept these very, very minimal conditions for the end of the war, conditions that are below what everybody else in the world enjoys right now. That Palestinians are not even, the, the demands of Hamas at this point are not, would have a long way to go before they would reach what every other person in the world is able to do which is have access to, I mean, no people, unless outside of conflict zones don't need access to humanitarian aid. They don't need to have the right to return to their bombed homes or with guarantees of safety. They don't need a ceasefire because they're not being bombed by the most intense bombing campaign against civilians in history. And they don't need a withdrawal of enemy troops from their territory because most of the world is not occupied by a genocidal occupier. So these conditions being, we've criticized before on this channel as that, that the Western leaders are talking about them as delusional or unrealistic, but these are, these are so far below basic human rights that it's, um, it's just another sign of how vile the world is that we live in the 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 west that runs the world and the regime that runs the world is uh really really truly vile that they make these notes these negotiating positions out to be unrealistic on the part of the palestinians that was all my substitute for saying no end in sight 
So that was a long way of saying no end in sight. I guess it's not exactly what, that. What I'm saying is not exactly no end in sight. But I'm not optimistic about negotiations. I'm not optimistic that Israel is ready to accept the reality of the military situation that I've been describing here and that I'm going to describe in this video. Let's do the news from the fronts. Gaza, you hopefully watched the Electronic Intifada live stream today where John uh, Elmer broke down some of the incredible videos that have come out just since our last sit rep on Monday. Was it Monday? It may have been. I think it was Monday. Um, so the eight minute video, the ambush of the righteous, which showed the details of the Al Zana ambush that I've been talking about for the past few sit reps. There was another, there was another incredible video of Saraya Al Quds uh, fighting in uh, Khan Yunus where they, there's a unbelievable shot of a fighter coming out with a rocket propelled grenade and hitting firing over a tank that's pointing right at him and then a, a mine blowing the tank up as well so it was just mind-boggling things that we're seeing happen uh, in these videos and the fact that there are videos of them uh i wanted to say also about gaza so we said when israel made this withdrawal from every from Khan Yunus right after the Al Zana ambush. They made this withdrawal from Khan Yunus. They've withdrawn everyone but the Nahal Brigade, one brigade, which is several thousand men, in that are in that uh are all along that road. They're stationed all along that road, the so-called Netzarim corridor that divides Gaza City from Khan Yunus, Rafa, etc. So it's it's the dividing line between north and south they say it cuts gaza in two but i um i said from the start that a, one brigade is just going to come under continuous fire until they either beef that up or withdraw that as well so that's what we're living now we've been watching mortar attacks reports of mortar attacks at various points uh of the Israelis engineering units um encampments so they're under fire they're under constant fire from the resistance in Gaza that's Gaza we have West Bank over the past few days there was a shooting operation in Salfit there was a settler mob that attacked Palestinians in Burqa Barqa or Burqa and there was fighting against them. Soria Al Quds reported attacking a settler vehicle at the settlement of Dotan and returned to their base in the West Bank. And there was an Israeli raid in Jeyus near Kalkilia. It's ongoing, it's a multi day raid. There's also an, a raid going on in Bir al Basha near Janin, where the Israelis are apparently besieging a house. So, very active situation in. The West Bank. Neighboring the West Bank, we have Jor Jordan. Jordan has been protesting continuously, huge street protests for the past three weeks. I said almost three weeks now. And there is a huge demonstration uh, in the nighttime. There have been 54 people. There are apparently 54 people in jail now for protesting, for participating in these protests in Jordan. And the slogans, as usual, we are the sons of Jordan, the ones who head down at all hours since the 7th of October so that we may grant victory to our family in Gaza, will uproot normalization and the Zionist project from every inch of our Arab land. We've been suppressed and arrested, but still we shout with all our throats. And even with all this, we're falling short. We promise you we will persist. So again, the slogans from Jordan have been very, very strong very very much fully identifying with people in gaza not not trying to distance themselves and saying we want to cease fire or, uh we you know both sides are wrong or anything like that there it's much more hamas we're with you yeah yes and we're with you uh abu Beda, we're with you that kind of thing 
Oh, oh I, I noticed there's more fighting in the West Bank in Nablus as well. So a lot of a lot of fighting in the West Bank. Big demonstrations in Jordan continue. On the Iraq front, the Iraqi resistance said they sent two more drones to attack the Haifa port. So Haifa port is under fire from the Iraqi resistance. The Yemen, Ansar Allah in Yemen, the so-called Houthis, they endured some bombing from the U.S. and the U.K. The U.S. and the U.K. did a joint bombing of Hodeida port in Yemen. Ansar Allah mm -hmm. also claimed uh, four attacks to uh, over the past day, I think. The Israeli ships MSC Darwin and Gina were hit, and the American ship Yorktown, as well as a warship, all were attacked with drones and missiles. And you may have seen, but the Ansar Allah did their Eid prayer, the end of the festival at the end of Ramadan Eid. They did their Eid Al Fitr prayer on the Galaxy Leader, the first ship that they captured in when they took the decision to intervene to try to stop the genocide in Gaza. And they did one of their prayers celebrating the end of Ramadan. They did that on the actual ship. And there's they took some video of that prayer time, prayer time. We also have Lebanon. As always, continuous missile attacks. There's a video of an attack on the Zebedine barracks. There's attack on the Ruaysat al-Alam site in Kafar Shuba Hills, the radar site at Shaba Farms, the Al-Asi site. There was a drone jamming device that was hit with a drone. There are soldiers at a site called Al-Baghdadi uh, hit on Shal Al Alam and the Doviv barracks. They destroyed a tank and it was with one of those cameras on the actual missile. So you see the missile kind of flying in and hitting the tank. One front where there's nothing to report yet is Iran. Iran is continuing to promise that there will be an attack on Israel directly. And so Israel's spokesperson of some kind said, well, if Iran hits us directly, we'll hit Iran directly. But I, I don't know if people are aware of the disparity of force between Iran and Israel, especially now. There's no, there's no, there's no Iraq, there's no Israel hitting Iran. There's America hitting Iran, but there's no way Israel can hit Iran without American help. First of all, it's pretty far. They have to fly over Jordan and Iraq or over Syria or Saudi Arabia. I mean, they've done it. They've done it before, but uh, it's not... They they have done covert... more For the most part, when they've done operations in Iran, they've, they've done covert attacks kind of like the one in terrorist attacks kind of like the one that happened in russia at the crocus theater that kind of stuff um israel does israel did attack iran long time long time ago as far as i know there hasn't been an airstrike on iran from israel in a very long time maybe somebody can correct me i could be wrong but i i seem to remember nothing in decades so that's a big thing I just said, so we'll see if I'm wrong. Um, they hit Syria all the time, as you know, including when they attack the Iranian consulate in Syria. It's not just far. Iran has multiple numbers of the population. They have, they were behind technologically, and uh, it's un, it's not clear what what the technological situation is in terms of Iran's abilities, but I know that they're better than they've ever been. And they're probably better relative to relative to Israel than they've ever been. So it's it's um Ira Israel threatening Iran is basically Israel threatening Iran with an American army. They're threatening to they would be threatening to bring 
America in and America America will come in when they decide to come in not uh that's one thing I wanted to say I've, I've been seeing people I've been seeing this phrase that Israel's trying to hit Iran so Iran hits Israel and forces America to come in so that term forces America to come in it I don't think that's quite right what I think is that all of these things that are happening right now are calculations that are being made about deterrence, about who can do what to who and who can get away with how much. And Israel's calculations about that are different from that of the US security establishment, the people that would be conducting this war that the US would be forced into, they would have some say about how, what they would be, allow themselves to be forced into and how they would conduct this war. It's not that you're then forced into a war and then the war just unfolds at maximum kinetic intensity. Uh, so there's deconfliction, there's there was that time that is that the U.S. asked if, hey, Iran, can we please bomb something in Iran and, and you not bomb us back? So, so being forced into a war with Iran as the United States doesn't necessarily mean everything. Um, the Iran launches massive missile attacks on all the local bases and closes the straits and the U.S. bombs Iran from it, from these same bases and those the various choke points of the global economy closed down and the prices of gas soar through the roof and all of these doomsday scenarios all just happen at once because America was forced in because Israel hit is uh, because Iran hit Israel somewhere. I don't I mean, you know, who know maybe we'll come and maybe sit rep on, on day 190 will describe exactly this happening, but I don't see that because, I don't think that the war up until this point has had that logic. Even if you think about it, the Israelis love to say we could have done more genocide as if that excuses them from the genocide they're doing. They like to say we could have done more, we could have nuked Gaza, etc. And on the other side, of course, the resistance side there's been enormous restraint shown. And the US also, I suppose, could have done a whole bunch of kinetic strikes on Iran already. They could have said, well, we consider ourselves to be forced in. We're going to use the fact that Iran is arm arming Yemen and arming Lebanon and arming Syria and arming the Palestinians and helping Syria not to fall under ISIS, US, Turkey, whatever, pressure and um, allying with Russia in Syria. And we could use any, the U.S. has plenty of pretexts they could use. They're, they're sanctioning Iran already. They're doing any number of horrific things to Iran right now. They can, they, they're not going to be forced into a war with Iran. They're going to choose a war with Iran. And they're going to choose it with their eyes open, knowing that all of this, all of these consequences are going to follow. And if they do it, they're going to do it anyway, of in spite of those consequences, the same way that Israel is doing things that I find to be counterproductive, to be contrary to Israel's interests because they have certain delusions of how much more powerful they are than their opponents. And of course, the US, we know that the US and the West has the same delusions, maybe to the same degree, maybe to a lower degree. I mean, I think there are military professionals in the US that have a lower degree of delusion about what they can accomplish in Iran. Again, I think if they didn't have 
that level of military realism, we would have seen a war in Iran by now. People since the early 2000s have said real men go to Tehran. There, there have been neoconservative operatives in positions of power in the U.S. since the late 90s who have wanted to attack Iran. Bomb, bomb Iran, John McCain. There have been people who wanted to attack Iran for that long, and the U.S. hasn't done it. And the U.S. didn't do it 20 years ago when Iran was much weaker than it is now. So who knows? Who knows? But the phrase, all of this was to say that the phrase, the U.S. is going to be forced to fight Iran by Israel, I don't think that's quite right. I think there is a discussion, a debate going on within the joint Israel-US uh, ruling class about what they're going to do and who they're going to bomb and who they're going to try to kill and how they're going to try to crush all the resistance that they've encouraged and sparked against them. But uh, striking Iran is certainly something they're talking about. It's certainly something that they consider to be an option. But uh, it's something that they're probably going to have to think about a lot before they do it. And when Iran responds, however they respond, that's when that conversation within the U.S. and Israeli elite will take on a new intensity about what they're going to do back, knowing that Iran will respond to the response and things will escalate from there. Okay, just I just wanted to kind of address that phrase as we conclude our report on the Iran front, where nothing has happened since the attack, since the assassination of um, senior Israel, um, Iranian General Zahedi at that uh, at the consulate in Syria. Okay. One other thing I wanted to, I was very moved by Ismail Hani. I watched some footage. That they showed some footage of him receiving the news and he kind of just, he's very stoic and he says, all right, well, let's, let's finish what we were doing. He was at a hospital. He was looking at, he was visiting with the wounded and and the statement from Ismail Haniye was, he said uh, a number of things. It was a long statement. It's definitely worth checking out if you have, he said. But the thing that struck me was he said, the enemy is delusional if they think that by killing my sons, we will change our positions. The blood of my sons is not more precious than the blood of our martyred people in Gaza, for they are all my children. They are all my sons. So, I mean, that's a, you know, that's a, thing that a real leader says and when you look when you contrast that with israelis or pro-israel people and the absolutely disgusting things that they have been saying every single day uh when they have personally risked nothing and personally lost nothing compared to this it's um it's a real contrast it's a real contrast so Okay, that concludes my news discussion on day 187. So as usual, you can get off the train here with no hard feelings. Um, because what I want to do today is a little bit of a lecture uh, on the idea of um, the Superman. And the, the what I think is the psychology and the philosophy that is driving what Israel is doing. I kind of, I've been blurting out something during these sit reps that I think there's actually more to and that it's worth going into a little bit with help from philosophy and reading some of these philosophers. Because what the thing that I blurted out at one point was you need to understand Israel by using psychology more than strategy because a lot of things that Israel is doing are not explicable in terms of military science or military strategy 
or political concepts. They are only explainable in terms of psychology, in terms of, of psychological disorder, disordered thinking, delusion, and, and other kinds of concepts from psychology. And so that's what I that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. And and um there that that's also another thing I wanted to address about some of the way that our team talks about racism against Palestinians. And you'll hear things like Palestinians have been dehumanized. Palestinians, uh, there's so much racism against Palestinians that we've watched 30, 40,000 be killed. We've watched 75,000 be wounded. We've watched this whole thing happen and nothing happened and no one cares. And that's because people are so right. The Westerners are so racist towards Palestinians. And again, I think this is a little bit wrong. This is not, can't be entirely wrong. There's no way I would argue that there isn't that race anti-Palestinian racism is not pervasive and unspoken and the fact that it's unspoken and there is barely a concept of it shows how pervasive it is. I wrote a pamphlet about anti-Palestinian racism a couple of wars ago now. And the but that's but that's not what's going on, I don't think. What I think is going on is not that Palestinians are super, super dehumanized, but that Israelis are super, super, super humanized. What is going on is that we have the West has assigned a group of people, the Western people in Israel, a status where their feelings of security, you'll see that term, Israeli security, their feelings of security, their rights, they have rights to, they have rights to things that others don't have rights to, especially Palestinians, that their feelings, their rights, their, their lives, their comforts matter much, much, much more than anyone else's and palestinians are the target because palestinians are the native people they're un, they're attacking if the uganda proposal had gone through in 1906 and herzl had set up the state of israel and begun a settlement process in what's now kenya it would be the kenyan people that would be dehumanized it would be the kenyan people that would be uh mass murdered and genocided for the sake of Israel, which would have been set up in that part of Africa instead of in Palestine. So it was, it's, it's the, it's the superhuman nature of Israelis, the master race nature of Israelis that is causing the genocide more than the fact that there's all of this racism against Palestinians there. I mean, obviously they're two sides of the same coin, but the, but the, the cause is the super rights and the super feelings of Israelis that leads to the dehuman. The corollary of that is the massive dehumanization and being Superman, being Superman is, does not work exactly the way that you think so being superman to to understand what a superman is you have to go to the literature from the 19th and the early 20th century nietzsche ralph waldo emerson these are the these are the ones that are um that are the keys to understanding what's happening here and this is a philosophy you know you may know uh, that I'm a fan of the Italian communist writer Domenico Lacerdo. And Lacerdo wrote a book, a long book about Nietzsche that I covered in my uh, in our World War Civ uh, podcast, The Causes of World War I. I read that book about Nietzsche, and that's where I learned a bunch about um, Nietzsche and about how Nietzsche was 
Lacerdo calls him an aristocratic rebel. And, you know, what does Nietzsche have to do with Zionism? As far as we know, Nietzsche was an anti-Semite. Well, this bear with me, because as uh, Amaresh Mishra, who was on this sit rep uh, channel a couple weeks back, he argued in his book about India and the mutiny of 1857 against British imperialism that all fascists are atheists and Nietzsche is an atheist and Nietzsche's atheism like Zionists is again doesn't work the way that you think and Superman and atheism uh, Nietzsche brings this together and, and and brought this together in the 19th century in a way that I think is is a really good provides a really good window into how Zionists think. This is a this is the philosophy that motivates Zionism. This is the atheist 19th century atheist racist philosophy that Zionists um, are motivated by. Now, I am not philosophy is not my discipline. I, I have. I have a major in an undergraduate major in history. All the other, all my other degrees are in science. Um, so I've been, I'm a reader of history. I do a history podcast. Um, but, and, and when I think about these problems, I, I think about them the way a historian does not a philosopher. So I, I know there are going to be those of you that are philo philosophically trained that are going to say, Nietzsche's not saying that, Emerson is not saying that, you've misunderstood, and that's why, this is part of why I don't do philosophy, because I don't get it in, in this way. I don't, I don't get, a, I don't like reading things where you read them and then people tell you what you just read isn't what you read. So this is why I try to stick to things like history, where that doesn't happen as much. It happens, but it doesn't happen as much. So Nietzsche is basically incomprehensible. He, he he gives you whatever you want to get in him. So I know there are left-wing Nietzscheans and so on. But Lacerdo's reading, which I do understand, which I did understand, is that Nietzsche is giving you an alternative to Marxism. Nietzsche is saying, where, where Marx says there's individuals, Nietzsche is no, where Marx says there's society and collectives and classes, Nietzsche is saying there's only individuals. When Marx says, you know, we advance, you know, we're trying to advance as a society so that everybody can uh, fulfill their potential as part of the society, Nietzsche says, no, we need to have a society of masters and slaves so that those masters can have the greatest lives and make the greatest art. So it's a, it's a, it's an op opposed philosophy. It's a philosophy of aristocracy. It's a philosophy of um, some people being masters and some people being natural slaves, as opposed to Marxism, which is a philosophy of equality. And they're contemporary philosophies, right? Marx and Nietzsche are around the same time. Nietzsche's a little bit later. Uh, Marx is a little bit earlier. And that's part of Nietzsche's thing, is basically trying to look at Marx and find all the things that he can attack and destroy in Marx. So the Superman. And the other thing is Marx is a, I mean, Nietzsche is a big fan of the American philosopher, poet, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And this 19th century milieu where Nietzsche is writing is the same milieu that produced the Zionists. It's the same milieu that from which ultimately Nazism sprang. And it's a milieu of racial supremacy. It's a milieu of Western the, the triumph of Western civilization, the idea that the West has triumphed over the world. And it's apparent because by the beginning of the 20th century, the West has conquered the whole world. The scramble for Africa, uh, all of Asia, India is part of the British Empire. All of Asia has been carved up. China is in the process of being carved up. There's either a, a zone of influence or an outright colony in every inch of the world almost with no exceptions. You know, Ethiopia won a battle with the Italians. Thailand managed to escape through some deft moves by their king. But other than that, 
everybody's either a colonizer and allied with the West or a colony of the West. So, and the British, the champion colonizers have the most developed race ideology and the Americans and the British are working on this together because the, is the American achievements and the British achievements are understood to be the achievements of the same Anglo-Saxon race, uh, Protestant religion, from which Zionism springs, as uh, you can read in uh, Ra Yaakov Rabkin, um, his books about Israel and, and Zionism. He says that Zionism is a Protestant ideology. Uh, it springs from Protestantism, and he shows you the books from the 17th century, the type of Bible. There's a certain Bible. Um, I wrote a series, an eight-part series for my Substack, which I'd recommend about this. Two, the Superman. So we are come with me to the 19th century as we take this historical approach to this philosophical text. And you have this aristocratic German, aristocratic rebel who's trying to argue against Marxism against the growing socialist movements of the day in favor of colonialism against the abolition of slavery and and um and what he the ideal that he puts forward that you can have if you are willing to get rid of all of these things all of these collective things these class things if you're willing to give get rid of all of these things, you can have a superman. A superman that can do things that normal men cannot. There's a herd, and then there's the superman. Okay, so here's a quote. There's there's a website, Red Sales, you might know. Uh, I really like Red Sales. They, they are big fans of Lacerdo, and they, um, they have a, a recent essay about Nietzsche and there's a quote from Nietzsche in this uh, essay so it's about religion so again when you think of Zionism as some something to do with the Jewish religion it's not really right Zionism is an atheist philosophy it's an atheist ideology and it's fundamentally anti-Jewish um, as uh as I argued, using a whole range of sources in my uh, eight-part uh, series on my Substack, if you want to check that out. So here's a quote from Nietzsche. To ordinary men, religion gives invaluable contentedness with their lot and condition, peace of heart, ennoblement of obedience, something of justification of all the commonplaceness, all the meanness, all the semi-animal poverty of their souls. Religion together with the religious significance of life, shed sunshine over such perpetually harassed men and makes even their own aspect endurable to them, almost turning suffering to account and in the end even hallowing and vindicating it. But it, that's what Nietzsche is saying as a good thing about religion. So the good thing about religion, according to Nietzsche, is that, um, that it makes kind of natural slaves happier with their lot. So what a what a Superman will do is use, this is also Nietzsche, a quote, use religion for his disciplining and educating work. So that's what a philosopher would do, is use religion. Religion is a tool, and that is precisely how the Zionists understand religion. It's a tool. The Jewish religion is a tool. It's for you getting those sheep, which they understand most Jewish people to be, and getting them to and using them for the ends of their uh, aggrandizement. So, um, as for Nietzsche's views on Jewish people, there's also a lot of fairly reasonable argument unless you're one of those philosophy people who has that deeper understanding that where the words don't mean what they mean but if you look at um 
another text by Nietzsche, which is the Antichrist. He says, um, he's talking about, Nietzsche's talking about how like more and more people, like when when the Jewish religion kind of evolved into Christianity, more and more people joined it, but then that becomes a herd, which is, and, and God, he says, remained the God of those chosen people. So he says, to be sure, the kingdom of God has grown larger with Christianity. Formerly, God had only his own people, his chosen people. But since then, he's gone wandering like his people themselves. He's given up settling quietly anywhere. Finally, he's come to feel at home everywhere and is the great cosmopolitan. So you see how he's kind of making fun of God. He's saying God is like a Jewish person. He's cosmopolitan. Until now, he has the great majority on his side and half the earth. But this God of the great majority, this Democrat among gods, has not become a proud heathen God. That's what Nietzsche likes. On the contrary, he remains a Jew. He remains a God in a corner, a God of all the dark nooks and crevices of all the noisome quarters of the world. His earthly kingdom now as always is a kingdom of the underworld, of hospitals, a souterrain kingdom, a ghetto kingdom. And he himself is so pale, so weak, so decadent, so... This I I think of this as anti-Jewish. That's what it. That's how it reads to me. Um, but maybe again, it's more subtle. He has also um, anti-Semites in this time in the nineteenth century. They hated Jewish people because they said that socialism and communism were Jewish conspiracies as well, because a lot of uh, Jewish people were involved in various socialist movements in all over Europe. And uh, so they, they the anti-Semites kind of noticed this and they said, well, that, that it must be a Jewish conspiracy. So they, they kind of worked both sides and the anti-Semites, they said, well, Jewish people are control all the money, but also Jewish people control the socialist movement. So, um, so Nietzsche has that criticism in his book book the genealogy of morals so he says um the the chronic and despotic esprit de corps like a spirit <coughs> and fundamental instinct of a higher dominant race coming into association with a meaner race an under race this is the origin of the antithesis of good and bad the master's right of giving names goes so far that it's permissible to look upon language itself as the expression of the power of the masters. It is because of this origin that the word good is far from having any necessary connection with altruistic acts. So he's saying the world is naturally divided into masters and slaves, and masters are the ones who decide what's good and bad, and then the herds follow. So whatever the master race decides is good, that's what's good. Um, that's, and, and if you're the master race now, you have the right to decide what's good. You don't have to go by what happened in the past, what, herds, what the herd today says. The herd today is, after all, just a bunch of a herd that is following what some master race person told them before if you're the master race now you get to make that definition and this is where he becomes anti-jewish he says it is in fact with the jews that the revolt of the slaves begins in the sphere of morals that revolt which has behind it a history of two millennia and which at the present day has only moved out of our sight because it has achieved victory so he says it's the jews that use morality and they use morality to um, define good. So they try to use reason. They try to use morality as tools. And they say, use the, we use these tools to define what's good, not just what some Superman says. And so it's science. That's the way Marxists think, right? In terms of science, in terms of facts and reason and, and moral principle. And... All of these things to Nietzsche are Jewish. And so that's why he doesn't like any of that. 
because it stands in the way of the natural order of masters and slaves, the natural hierarchy. Um, so it's not, you know, I'm, I'm blaming Nietzsche for a lot of this, but it's not just Nietzsche, right? There's also Ralph Walder, Waldo Emerson, who Nietzsche was a big fan of. And Emerson also has this. He's trying to create a Superman, right? He says, um, power is in nature the essential measure of right. This is uh, the essay, Self-Reliance. Nature suffers nothing to remain in her kingdoms, which cannot help itself. So that's uh, might makes right, right? Um, he's also he's also saying, you know, if the world hates you, that doesn't matter because the world is full of sheep and you're not, you shouldn't be a sheep. So he's he's explaining how to be someone who doesn't care what people think. He says, it's easy for a firm man who knows the world to brook the rage of the cultivated classes. Their rage is decorous and prudent for they're timid as being very vulnerable themselves. But when to their feminine rage, the indignation of the people is added, when the ignorant and poor are aroused, when the unintelligent brute force that lies at the bottom of society is made to growl and mow, it needs the habit, growl and mow, sorry, it needs the habit of magnanimity and religion to treat it godlike as a trifle of no concernment. So he's saying it takes that special super kind of man to ignore the ignorant and poor to ignore the whole of society and that's you know that's something to admire the ability to ignore all of society is something that makes a super man and i think that is also a real comfort for all of the western elites right now that are supporting this genocide and saying look how great we are how how super we are because we are ignoring that our, the fact that majorities of our society are against this genocide and majorities in the world are against this genocide, but that's not what concerns us. We're not, you know, this is the essay Self-Reliance where you might've heard uh, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. So, and here's another one about like kind of the Superman and, and tribalism. He says, do not tell me as a good man did today, of my obligation to put all poor men in good situations. Are they my poor? I tell thee, thou foolish philanthropist, that I grudge the dollar, the dime, the cent I give to such men as do not belong to me and to whom I do not belong. So you should only really care about your own people. And that is also a very um, motivating thing for Israel. Okay, so that was a long philosophical discussion uh, with quotes from Nietzsche and Emerson. And what do they prove? I mean, that's not enough maybe to prove anything, um, especially in philosophy, which, like I said, is everything to everybody. But my point is that this helps you understand Israel's behavior. Why? Because if you're looking in Jewish tradition for Israel's behavior, you're not going to get very far. If you're looking to um, the Bible, I mean, sure, but the Bible is even more a, a book where you can find whatever you want to find. And the Zionists have a very instrumental reading of the Bible. The question is not, can you find genocidal passages in the Bible? The question is, how are Zionists reading, who don't even believe in God, how are they reading the Bible? How are they, why are they reading the Bible this way? Why are they picking these passages? They're picking these passages because these are the passages that they, that motivate them because of this philosophy, because of this psychology. So um, if you're looking for why Israel is willing to abandon their hostages, why Israel is willing to spend lives, as I've said, committing atrocities in Al Shifa while their armor is being destroyed around Al Shifa, while their soldiers are being attacked around Al Shifa. In Khan Yunus, they were ambushed in this Alzana ambush while they were off 
blowing up buildings and trying to attack Al Nasser Hospital at Al Amal Hospital. They are they are going to try to commit atrocities and they are being killed for it and they are not changing their course. They are continuing to do the exact same thing. Because so how does that make sense if if Jewish tradition is that Jewish lives are special. If Jewish, if settler colonial uh, tradition is that the settlers are are worth ten of the natives, or if colonialism is that the land is is what we're after and we don't want the native people, well, why are they willing to spend their own people's lives to solely to commit atrocities and? Why are they willing to defy international, you know, rip up international law, rip up the International Criminal Court, rip up the United Nations Security Council, alienate all their allies, humiliate their allies? Why are they doing all of that? Like Jordan, you know, humiliate Turkey. Now Turkey has has promised that they're going to cut exports to Israel because Israel took these humiliating stances towards turkey they've alienated russia to some extent anyway why are they doing this why would they do this how does this square with their stated reading of the bible for example this is none of this is in the bible um and none of this also is is in the idea that uh that their lives matter more what this is is the Superman does whatever he wants. The Superman decides what's good. International law doesn't decide what's good. Um, the superior race imposes what they want. It's not a genocide if we're doing... We we decide what a genocide is. You don't decide what a genocide is. You don't call it a genocide. We call, What we say is... It's not a genocide unless we say it's a genocide. So October 7th, and that's... Um, that's genocide, but killing 40,000, 50,000 Palestinians, you know, most of them children and and uh, women and destroying hospitals and field executions, all of these atrocities that we were, that's not genocide. That's not genocide because we didn't say it's genocide. What we, we are the ones who decide, we're the ones who define what words mean. We're the ones who define whether the law is followed or not, and and our and 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 Israel in particular proves all of this by killing. So it's that ability to kill, it's the right to kill, and it's the constant killing that reveals that they are the ones who carry that racial superiority. So. I think um, the defiance, the recording, the impunity, all of these things are part of this 19th century race, racialist philosophy of the Superman, atheist, racialist philosophy of the Superman. The, the point is we're going to create a kind of person, a kind of human being that is superior. And in fact, if you look at, I, I I cited some of this literature in my um, my series on Zionism as an anti-Jewish ideology on Substack. There's a a big book by a rabbi, uh, Rabbi Shapiro, and he has a big, huge book, like 13, 1500 pages or something. And one of the some of the chapters are about how. Zionists believed in trying to shape a new kind of Jewish person. So they adopted all of these anti-Semitic beliefs about how Jews were collectivist and Jews were physically weak and Jews were always trying to get equality because they weren't those actual vigorous, murderous supermen that Nietzsche and wanted, wanted people to be. So they said, no, we can do that. And we're going to do that through the army. We're going to shape Jewish people into what we want them to be through the institution of the army. So there's a bunch of chapters in Shapiro's book about this. Um, and, uh, and I don't think it succeeded, right? It didn't succeed in making a coherent society. Um, it did probably, you know, it, but it, but it, it did create this ideology 
as the motivating ideology for the army and everybody goes through the army conscription and everybody all the children are getting ready to go into the army and then at the once they become older teenagers they join the army and then they come out of the army and and um, are ready to be called up to go and commit atrocities in the west bank and gaza or wherever else so it's um it's there in in zionist ideologists and their goals that they've set out for themselves and it's um it's also there's an amazing there's an amazing tweet that i saw by former israeli prime minister naftali bennett and i'm just finding it here naftali bennett said something amazing he said we need to be silicon valley in sparta check this out check this out you guys israel needs to live as silicon silicon valley in sparta part of israel's colossal failure was a result of complacency your typical israeli was enjoying life thinking about work the next startup and the upcoming vacation wars no that's passe we got soft we lost tolerance to casualties we forgot we're surrounded by the craziest terror savages. So this is racism, right? Um, Israel is a first world economy. Im imagine San Jose neighboring Kabul. October 7th is, a, is as if savages with machetes tore down the screens of the Truman Show. And we saw the barbarism hiding behind those facades. We realized our neighbors aren't Belgium, Canada, or Vermont. We're cruelly reminded that Israel's existence depends on us being constantly alert, vigilant, strong, and very, very tough. Superman. At the same time, we must continue to be the startup nation, innovative, technologically savvy, agile, and connected to the latest and best stuff going on. It's a challenge no other fit nation faces to be a Silicon Valley in Sparta. So Sparta, I mean, Sparta, of course, was a slave society. Um, and much admired by the 19th century uh, imperialist racist, right? Because they're they were a slave. I mean Nietzsche Nietzsche's dream. It's society of Spartans and Helots. The Helots are the slaves that do all the work, so the Spartans can be the warriors. Um, the Silicon Valley is a spinoff of the military industrial complex, so nothing. Um, too surprising there. <laughs> I mean, we got soft. We lost tolerance to casualties. So this is this is an expression of that, right? We are we are supposed to be supermen. We need to be supermen here, and we're we lost that that vigor. <clears throat> and um, and so. A lot of what Israel and oh, and by the way, well, one other point about this because you hear Kirby, um, the other guy Blinken, you hear these guys, these American spokespeople for Israel, uh, and they say they say we don't care about anything else, whatever you know, everything else. The only thing that matters is that October seventh never happen again, and that was in Naftali Bennett's thing too, and. The, just like there's some something they're expressing there that it's so important to them that October 7th never happened again. What is that? What is that? And what that is, I believe that's a psychological truth that they're expressing. It is that their identity as the masters, their identity as the superior race, their identity as the overman, the over the overman, the uber man, right? that identity was what was um challenged on october 7th and that is what they're saying must never happen again so if they are to be the supermen who do whatever they want that can we can they cannot allow those kinds of events to happen again um and of course if by october 7th you mean the 
a defeat by a a military defeat inflicted on you by a poorly armed but better prepared and better organized opponent that's happening all the time it's happening every day in gaza now it's happened at alzana in a spectacular way so it's not they don't understand it that way they're not capable of understanding it that way there this it's also why they're not Re the, the, there are a lot of downsides to believing you're a racial superman if you, you the up there's an upside in the sense that there's incredible confidence and if you have incredible confidence you can accomplish things that someone without that confidence cannot um in the jewish tradition not the zionist tradition in the jewish tradition you know they they have a word for it right chutzpah so like um but if you have that confidence, of course, that also translates into military, um, like audacity. It also translates, but but that's not a monopoly of of any uh, racial, self identified racial group, and you can see that everybody has access to audacity. Everybody has access to confidence, and um, so that's that's an upside, but it's not the only the only it's not the only route to confidence, right? I mean, the confidence of a religious person who believes that there's a higher power on their side is also a pretty, as we are watching, um, a pretty strong source of confidence as well. So the upside is confidence. The downside is overconfidence. The downside is you can't learn from mistakes because you already think you know, and you you have to radically underestimate the people you're fighting because you your whole worldview is that you're vastly superior to them. And everything that Israel is doing now in America is to try to restore that image that they are the supermen who do what they want. And above all, they're the supermen who kill who they want. And they're still killing, and they're killing away. Um, but there's another side to this coin, um, which is that there, and you know, and and here we I have to go back to Stalin. Um, and Stalin made a famous speech, you know, the brothers and sisters speech of July 7th, 1941, when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, and Stalin said, um, he said, history shows there are no invincible armies, and there never will be, or there never have been. There are no invincible armies. That's what history shows. And so, you know, there are also no supermen. Uh, that's the secret. There are no racial, there is no master race and there are no supermen and you're not Sparta and you're not Silicon Valley in Sparta and you're not worth 10 times what your opponents are and you're not better. Um, and some imperialists actually understood this. There's a famous British imperialist who was one of these professors at Cambridge um, Rob, John Robert Seeley, and he said, he said, you know, the moment a mutiny is threatened, he, he was writing about 1857 India, but he said, you know, the moment there's a mutiny that's, th that's based on the expression of a universal feeling of nationality, our empire is over. All hope of preserving our empire is at an end. And he said, we are not really conquerors of India. We cannot rule her as conquerors. He's basically saying the only reason they can rule is because Indians are divided between one another. And Gandhi came decades later and said the same thing. Indian nationalists uh, said the same thing, that it's the divisions between uh, people that are exploited by the imperialists. If those divisions are overcome, the imperialists can't maintain their power. So what they think is racial superiority is in fact divisions among their opponents that and they're they've they've deluded themselves this whole thing of a master race this whole philosophy of the superman and natural masters and natural slaves it's all an illusion caused by 
usually a temporary division among the people that are conquered and oppressed. And those divisions are very much in the process of being overcome in the case of the Palestinian resistance and now the axis of resistance. And it is continues to be these divisions and these alliances, as I've spelled out in previous historical sit reps with Jordan, with Egypt, with Turkey, with the Gulf monarchies, these are the basis of Western power, of Israeli power in that region, and not racial superiority. Um, and that is what is at stake. That is that is the historical process that we are watching unfold right now. It is not a contest between the master race and uh, the unt untermensch. It is, it is a revolutionary war over the who is going to ally with the Western powers and who is going to ally with the resistance and that war of trying to win these alliances to one side and the other is what's happening right now. And that's why Jordan, that's why the Palestinian Authority, that's why Egypt, that's why Turkey, that's why these, these places that are continue to be quiet are being watched very carefully by the West because these are the places that are the real basis of Israel's power in the region and Israel's ability to endure in the region. And the fact that Yemen and Iraq increasingly and the Palestinian uh, res resistance in general, and now Jordan and um, Iraq and Iran, the fact that these are uh, not on board with the project anymore is why the war is unfolding as it is. So what is all of this? What what can we, what do we do? Do is there anything to do about this? Um, you know, if there's a bunch of people who believes they're racially superior, what do you do with them? Well, uh, you have to start with the fact that they're not, and you have to like our understanding of the world is materialist. We understand the world in terms of materialism. We understand the world in terms of hard power. And that is, that's, um, you know, there's will and there's consciousness and there's propaganda and there's lies and there's defining words how you want, but then there's a battle uh, on the ground. And, uh, and that's, that's where, as I've said many times, that's where this contest is going to be decided. So that was my little philosophical exegesis. I believe that's how you pronounce that word. <clears throat> I am sure that some of you philosophy majors are going to give me a hard time because I've completely missed and say that I've completely misread these texts. Um, I have um, some backing. Uh, in the sense that I I did read Lacerdo on Nietzsche, so I'm not just uh, cherry-picking quotes. I read various essays on red sales, but I, I read that big book by Lacerdo, and I know Lacerdo's work, and I know where he's coming from, so that's where I'm coming from. Uh, and I do know a lot about the history of the 19th century and imperialism and, and the, the intellectual milieu, so I feel confident in in my claim that Zionism has these roots, that Zionism is one of these ideologies and that, um, that this is, this is something that can help you understand and predict what Israel is doing and the, the mindset behind what Israel is doing better than certainly better than what they say. Uh, than what they've been saying their motivations are, their stated motivations 
make no sense in terms of what what their behavior. Um, okay. So we will see what happens over the coming days. There will probably be momentous events. So like and subscribe and hang in there and uh, I will be back and I'll see you in the next.